Welcome to CNU, the video series that will teach you everything you need to know to provide excellent nutrition care. In this video, I'm going to teach you some of the basic guidelines for starting a patient on parenteral nutrition. By the end of the video, you should be able to describe parenteral nutrition, including a few risks and benefits, and identify patients who are good candidates for parenteral nutrition. If you find this video helpful, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Let's get started. Simply put, parenteral nutrition is intravenous nutrition, or nutrition administered into a vein. Instead of nutrients being delivered and absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract, as they would with someone who is eating or receiving tube feeding, the nutrients are fused directly into the bloodstream through a vascular access device. Unlike standard IV fluids, a parenteral nutrition solution can contain all of the essential nutrients. This includes carbohydrate in the form of dextrose, protein as amino acids, lipids, electrolytes such as sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium, vitamins, trace elements like chromium, copper, selenium, manganese, and zinc, and water. There is also the potential to provide 100% of the estimated nutritional needs of the patient when necessary, and an infusion can be sustained for days to weeks to years. In some instances, patients receive parenteral nutrition for as long as they live. Despite being a life-saving therapy, parenteral nutrition is not the preferred method of feeding a patient. This is because it carries a much higher risk for complications than both eating and tube feeding. These complications include, but are not limited to, hyperglycemia, gut atrophy from not using the gastrointestinal tract, liver dysfunction, infection, electrolyte abnormalities, and overall impaired immune function. In addition to this, the cost of parenteral nutrition is considerably higher than the alternatives. This is not just because of the ingredients. It is also from the resources needed to obtain venous access, closely monitor blood chemistry, and manage complications. It is for these reasons that parenteral nutrition should only be considered when a patient is unable to meet his or her nutritional requirements through eating and or tube feeding. A few conditions that can lead to this predicament are obstruction of the small intestine, whether it is a mechanical or functional obstruction, severe malabsorption, which often results from surgical resection of the small intestine, and persistent and severe gastrointestinal bleeding. I provide a little more detail on each of these in my video on the indications and contraindications for enteral nutrition, which you can find here. For each of the conditions, providing food or tube feeding may not be feasible at all. Parenteral nutrition allows us to maintain or improve the nutritional status of the patient until the more desirable options become available and adequate intake is achieved. This, of course, is the primary benefit of it. At this point, you may be asking yourself, so if a patient cannot eat or receive tube feeds, they should be started on parenteral nutrition? The answer really depends on two main factors. First, it depends on the nutritional status of the patient. Second, it depends on the length of time, or projected length of time, that the patient will be unable to meet their nutritional needs through eating or tube feeding. This is how it shakes out. If a patient is found to meet at least two of the criteria for malnutrition, they should be considered for parenteral nutrition as soon as it is determined that the gastrointestinal tract is not functional. Those criteria include moderate to severe loss of body fat or muscle mass on physical assessment, unintentional weight loss of greater than 5% body weight times 1 month, more than 7.5% times 3 months, more than 10% times 6 months, or at least 20% times 1 year. 
Then we have inadequate energy intake, which is characterized by meeting less than or equal to 50% of the estimated calorie needs for greater than one week, or less than or equal to 75% of the estimated calorie needs for one month or greater. If a patient appears well-nourished, has no recent weight loss, and was eating well prior to admission, but is still considered to be at risk for becoming malnourished due to an inability to eat or receive tube feeds, you can avoid starting parenteral nutrition for up to 7 days, at which point it should strongly be considered to prevent malnutrition. The maximum amount of time that any patient should go without starting parenteral nutrition is 14 days. So, if a patient meets the criteria for malnutrition, you consider parenteral nutrition right away. If they are well nourished, you should wait up to 7 days and no more than 14 days. There is a third category of patients that must be addressed. This category includes patients who have a functional gastrointestinal tract and are able to receive food and or tube feeding, but have not been able to achieve adequate intake due to an issue such as malabsorption or vomiting. In this case, supplemental parenteral nutrition can be considered if the patient is unable to meet greater than 60% of the estimated energy needs with enteral nutrition after 7 to 10 days. Here are three examples of these guidelines in action. First, we have a 79-year-old male who presents with a small bowel obstruction and is expected to be unable to eat for at least 5 days. The patient is found to have a 20-pound weight loss in the past two months and has severe muscle depletion to the shoulders, clavicle, and temporalis. This patient meets two of the criteria for malnutrition and should be considered for parenteral nutrition right away. Second, we have a 25-year-old female who presents with bloody diarrhea for one day. The projected length of time she will be unable to eat is unclear. The patient is found to have an 8-pound weight gain over the past year and has excellent muscle tone for her age. In this situation, the patient can be monitored and treated with standard IV therapy for up to 7 days. If at 7 days it is still determined to be unsafe to use the gastrointestinal tract, she should be considered for parenteral nutrition. For the third example, we have a patient who presented after having persistent vomiting for the past 72 hours. The patient has a jejunostomy for tube feeding after suffering from a stroke, and she has only been tolerating an average of 400 calories per day while her goal is 1600. This patient should have her symptoms managed medically with the goal of increasing the tube feeding as her condition improves. Supplemental parenteral nutrition should be considered if she is unable to meet greater than 60% of the estimated energy needs with enteral nutrition after 7 to 10 days. In any case, once parenteral nutrition is started, it should be maintained until adequate intake from food and or tube feeding is achieved. The patient must also demonstrate the capacity to tolerate it. A common threshold used for weaning a patient from parenteral nutrition is greater than 60% of the estimated energy needs, which can be determined with close monitoring of the food that is consumed and or the amount of formula infused through the tube feeding device. This monitoring is sometimes formalized into a 3 to 5 day calorie count. Here is a summary for this lesson. Parenteral nutrition is a life-saving therapy that allows for the delivery of all the essential nutrients when the gastrointestinal tract is not functional. Patients can survive for days to weeks to years on parenteral nutrition, but it should only be used when meeting their nutritional demands through eating and or tube feeding is not feasible. This is because it carries a higher risk for complications such as infection, gut atrophy, and liver dysfunction. It is also considerably more expensive than the alternatives. When determining if a patient is a good candidate to receive parenteral nutrition, close attention must be paid to the nutritional status of the patient and the length of time they are anticipated to be unable to receive adequate energy from food or tube feeding.
If a patient satisfies at least two of the criteria for malnutrition, they should be considered for parenteral nutrition as soon as it is determined that the gastrointestinal tract cannot be used. If a patient is generally well nourished, they can be treated with standard IV fluids for up to seven days before being considered for parenteral nutrition. The total waiting period should last no more than 14 days. In some circumstances, a patient will be receiving food and or tube feeding, but will be unable to sustain adequate intake due to a complication like malabsorption or vomiting. When this happens, a patient should be considered for parenteral nutrition if they are unable to achieve an intake of greater than 60% of the estimated energy needs after 7 to 10 days. No matter the circumstance that leads to parenteral nutrition being used, it should be kept until adequate intake from food and or tube feeding is achieved and the patient demonstrates the capacity to tolerate it. Greater than 60% of the estimated energy demands is the most common threshold used to justify weaning. Thank you for watching. Check out these videos for more content just like this.